On his website, Freedom From Religion Foundation, Dan Barker, author of God, the Most Unpleasant Character in All of Fiction, lists 10 of what he considers to be the worst Old Testament verses in the Bible. He begins with number 10 in this article, labels it, God destroys a good family for no reason. Welcome back to the Reformed Rant, where I rant about the most pressing theological, philosophical, and social issues of the day, but from a distinctly Reformed Christian perspective. Uh, today, I return to one of my most favorite subjects, um, one of my favorite fields, Christian apologetics. I will readily admit that the field of Christian apologetics uh, has, over the last 20 years or so, maybe a little longer, become littered with uh, people who are idolaters uh, of the intellect. In fact, um, if you encounter many Christian apologists, uh, one of the things that you are going to discover that a lot of them have in common is that they seem to be absolutely infatuated with and in love with their own intellect. Um, and this really gives me great consternation when I see what has happened to this field. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, so that you understand where I'm coming from as I walk through what I'm going to call a review uh, or an interaction with what is touted to be the strongest argument for the existence of God coming from a classical uh, method or approach to Christian apologetics. Um, in the interest of fair disclosure, I studied the classical method of Christian apologetics under Norman Geisler, but after my shift to Reformed theology, which took place over 20 years ago, I shifted to Cornelius Van Til's method and began reading Van Til, Bonson, Frame, Oliphant, and a number of others. My professor uh, for that particular area uh, was Mike Butler, who was Greg Bonson's protege. Today, I'm going to walk through an informal review of a discussion that took place back in August of this year between Frank Turek and Tricia Scribner on Turek's program, Cross Examined. Buckle up. I have a lot to say about how we think about and approach the subject of apologetics. All right. We are once again coming back to the subject of apologetics, and specifically apologetic method. A friend of mine uh, recently sent me a link to Frank Turek's site, Crossfire, where he had Tricia Scribner and himself on the program talking about the argument for God from causality, which is part of the cosmological argument for God's Existence. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to give my response uh, to what I think about that particular method of defending the faith. Of course, both Scribner and Turek are huge Southern Evangelical Seminary um, proponents. And in fact, gosh, 20 some odd years ago, uh, when I first really formally started studying apologetics. I was turned on to, to apologetics uh, when I lived in uh, upstate New York back in the early 90s. Uh, I stumbled upon Robbie Zacharias's ministry. And from there, um, I found Norman Geisler. And as uh, I would say chance, but there is no such thing as, as it would turn out, I moved to North Carolina not long after that in the late 90s and studied uh, apologetics under uh, Norman Geiser. I read everything Geiser wrote on the subject, listened to all his lectures, and uh, actually took his course in apologetics at Southern Evangelical Seminary when they were still in a trailer. So <clears throat> I'm familiar, very familiar, with the classical method, which is what's being employed 
by Frank Turek. And uh, in this particular um, conversation about um, apologetic method, the the subject matter is a book called Answering the Music Man, which is a response to Dan Barker. Now, my professor in apologetics, Mike Butler, who was Greg Bonson's uh, student uh, back in the day, uh, actually has a, a debate, uh, and it's a two-parter. You can go to Covenant Media Foundation and search on that. Um, go to just Google Covenant Media, and you can actually get that debate for free. Um, so I'm familiar with with Dan Barker, and I'm familiar with um, with his uh, his objections to Christianity, which are. I mean, this guy actually went to seminary in the day, and uh, his objections are philosophically and theologically embarrassing when you when you actually look at them. It's you read his objections, his arguments, and you cannot help but think, "Gosh, this guy really." Uh, first of all, no atheist really understands Christianity. That's the first problem when we're talking to atheists about the Christian worldview. This is why you should do your best to to limit your your interactions with atheists to a presentation of the gospel, um, and then may, you know to answer objections that they they might have, which are us- usually very practical um, objections. Um, You'll find that a lot of what goes on in the field of apologetics is borderline intellectual idolatry, in my opinion. Now, if you're going to teach apologetics, you're probably going to need to buckle up and and spend a lot of time studying uh, not just theology. Theology, first and foremost, that's going to be your drive. You're probably going to have to pick up some philosophical resources and understand some of the basic concepts uh, that are talked about in philosophy because these things are going to be are going to come up in conversation you should at least have some familiarity with them but um, to to take it to the place that Southern Evangelical Seminary takes it is really uh, a different ball game so, the argument for God from causality. This is really where uh, Turek and, and Scribner are camping out. And this, is, this should come as no surprise because that is Southern Evangelical Seminary. That is the classical method. That's where they go. Um, so, this is an argument uh, in which the existence of God is inferred from alleged facts concerning things like causation, motion, um, change, etc., this is essentially Thomas Aquinas's first way that I'm going to cover first. I'm going to just walk you through the argument. Uh, and it's found in his Summa Theologico, uh, Part 1, Question 2, the third article. Um, so if you're curious why it's called uh, the first way, it's because Aquinas lists five ways the existence of God can be proven. And we're going to spend most of our time on the second way, but I'll run through both of these to kind of give you uh, the the contour of how the this argument moves. And if you you'll notice the first two, the first way and the second way are very similar in how they move from motion to unmoved mover calls to uncaused calls. Uh, some things in the world are in motion. So it is said, this is uncontroversial, right? We can see that. It's absolutely the case. So that's where we start. All right. So we observe motion. What, whatever is in motion is put in motion by another. That's premise two. Third, it is impossible that anything could ever move itself. Fourth, it is impossible that an infinite regression of movers should exist. And then finally, the conclusion, therefore, it is necessary that there be an unmoved first mover. This mover we understand to be God. Now, okay, the question that we're, we're, we have to ask is, when you look at that argument, does it prove the existence of God? 
the Christian God. Does it prove that? And we'll come, we'll come back to that later. Look at it and honestly ask yourself the question, what does the argument actually prove, if anything? It is on Aquinas' the second way that Tarek and Scribner spend the majority uh, of their time, and that argument goes like this. In the world of sense, there is an order of efficient causes. There is no case known, second premise, there is no case known in which a thing is the efficient cause of itself. Okay, third premise, an infinite regress, sound familiar, of efficient causes is impossible because there could be no first cause. And if no first cause, no intermediate cause. And if no intermediate cause, no ultimate or immediate cause. Therefore, we must admit that there is a first efficient cause. And this cause, everyone gives the name God. Okay, These, th these two arguments um, are really two of the, like, the bedrock of the uh, classical method of, of apologetics. All right. Now, uh, I want to offer up some theological criticisms, and in, in the interest of fair disclosure and transparency, uh, I am a uh, Reformed Baptist, uh, which makes that makes me a Calvinist, which means that I affirm what we call the doctrine of total depravity. I also affirm that Scripture is our final authority for all truth. So any truth claim, uh, such as the one we're dealing with here, we have to turn to Scripture as our final authority. So if you ask the question, does God exist? Well, <clears throat> if our final authority is Scripture then it seems to me that we turn to Scripture to answer that question, and I think the Scripture teaches that he does. The problem for the classical apologists is that they don't want to turn to Scripture to answer this question. They want to affirm that Scripture is our epistemic authority. They want to affirm that truth. But they want to pretend that we can turn to other sources and that it's okay to turn to other sources to answer this question, arguments, evidence, inferences, implication, yada, yada, yada. Right? So the method of apologetics used in these kinds of arguments by the classical folks uh, have two flawed presuppositions, and those presuppositions are directly related to their theology. This is why this is a theological criticism of the argument. It's really the only criticism I need, but we can also offer up philosophical criticisms of the argument as well, which I'll do in a few minutes. Number one, flawed presupposition number one. They assume that neutrality on the part of the unbeliever is possible. They can be completely neutral where the question of God is concerned. From this, they conclude that the unbeliever can reason autonomously, independently from God. The unbeliever is not dependent on God for arriving at the truth of reality. This is very problematic theologically speaking, biblically speaking, okay? The second flawed presupposition is that these methods assume that Christians should grant or at least pretend that atheists do not believe God exists and that they need a certain kind of evidence to conclude that God exists. That is, the atheist is justified in his belief about God at this point and about reality, given the way the atheist understands the evidence and given the evidence that the atheist has in front of them, right? From this flawed presupposition, they conclude that the thing that is lacking is either the evidence itself or how the unbeliever interprets the evidence. So, if the apologist can show that there is something deficient where the evidence is concerned, he can show 
that the unbeliever's belief about God is not really justified after all. This requires the apologist to so-called remove the obstacles, so to speak, so that the unbeliever can act more rationally and embrace Christ. Now, you, you will hear this idea on removing the obstacles, not just in the area of apologetics. You hear it in evangelism, in relationship evangelism. You, you hear it in uh, church growth ideas, that there are, there are things about Christianity that uh, strike the unbeliever in our society as immediately offensive. It's an obstacle to Christian belief, and we have to remove those roadblocks and obstacles, right? You hear um, Andy Stanley down in Georgia talking about uh, some of these obstacles, and and uh, disturbingly enough, Stanley actually uses the virgin birth, which makes me wonder, is there anything sacred enough in the Christian worldview that these guys would be unwilling to remove it uh, so that someone could come to faith in Christ. In other words, Stanley argues that, oh, if the virgin birth, if, it, if the idea of a virgin having a child offends you, you find that scandalous, you don't have to affirm that in order to be a Christian. Now, Stanley affirms it. But he tells other people, "You okay, I get it. It's an obstacle. That, you know, that's not all there is to Christianity. It's a lot more than just the virgin birth. So, okay, you can remove that. The question then starts to become, how many of these obstacles can we toss out in order to get people to join the Christian club, right? And that is, that's a serious problem. The very principle itself is a problem, as you should right now. You sh- it should be self self-aware at this point that uh, that this is a real issue. And the issue is theological, not just philosophical. It's theological first and foremost. It's, the, it's, the, it's driving the anchor into a, a distinctly Arminian theology, semi-Pelagian theology in many cases, and in some cases, sadly enough, an outright Pelagian theology. Now, both of these assumptions about how unbelievers reason and what Scripture instructs Christians to do regarding that reasoning are false. And let's let's give you the argument for why. Number one, the unbelieving mind is not neutral and is incapable of being neutral concerning the spiritual truths that deal with the nature of reality. Scripture teaches us this. This is the first question that we have to ask. Is it possible for an unregenerate mind to be morally neutral where the spiritual truths of reality are concerned according to the Scripture? Well, Romans 8, 7 tells us this. The unregenerate mind, the fleshly mind, is hostile to God, not neutral, If the mind is fleshly, and those are the minds that we are dealing with when we're dealing with atheists and unbelievers, they all, to a person, have a fleshly mind. There's no no such thing as an unbeliever who does not have an unregenerate fleshly mind. Okay? All fleshly minds are hostile to God. Therefore, the unbeliever's mind, every unbelieving mind, is hostile hostile to God. That's a problem for this method. And we can't just run past it winking, nodding. It's a serious problem. It's a roadblock to this type of thinking. It, the, it, Paul says the unbelieving mind does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even, the Greek word ude, which is which, is, which serves to add emphatic negative here, is not even able to do so. Now, I could run through New Testament examples on how the use of this little marker, this word ude in the Greek, uh, how it is used to emphasize a negative. Paul says that the unbelieving mind isn't even able to subject itself to 
the law of God. It's unwilling. It's unable. Ephesians 4.17, keeping with the keeping with the theme of the unbelieving mind, tells us not to walk as Gentiles do. Well, why not? How do Gentiles walk? Well, Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. The futility of their mind, being dark in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance that is in them. Because of the hardness of their heart. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the Apostle Paul says, The God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel. What happens in Arminianism is that uh, we are told that the Arminian actually does see the light of the gospel. They do see the truth of the gospel. They are able to submit to the law of God. They are able to understand the law of God. They have all the information that they need, all the ability that they need, and they just decide, nah, I'm not, I'm not into it. I don't really want it, right? So... The issue for them in, in evangelism and in apologetics is, is making sure that you present Christ in the right way and making sure that you give them all the right information because their reason for not coming to Christ is, is probably because of how somebody presented the gospel to them or probably because of hypocrisy in the church or probably because of just some misunderstanding on their part concerning the evidence for God and for Christianity. And if the Christian will just present God in just the right way and give them enough information and evidence, then they will see that Jesus makes the most sense and they will take the plunge and join the Christian club. This is the soteriology and the thinking behind the classical method. And it is deeply entrenched in Arminian soteriology. And not, it, sadly enough, in our day, not classical Arminianism. Not what Arminian taught, Arminius taught. Arminius actually affirmed the doctrine of total depravity. Modern classical Arminianism most of it is Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism. Most of it is heresy. And it's sad to say this, that when most modern Arminians are pressed on their Arminian theology, rather than correcting the errors of that theology, they compound those errors by moving from maybe a, a more uninformed classical Arminianism to open theism, to uh, process theology, and even to universalism. And it ends up even in, in, in places where uh, even William Lane Craig, who is a, a classical apologist, a re outright rejection of the necessity of the gospel of Jesus Christ for salvation. Now, they try to wiggle out of this, but that's the fact. If you argue that someone can be saved apart from hearing the gospel so that you might believe the gospel, then you are arguing that, sal that the gospel is not necessary for salvation. And that, my friend, is rank heresy far outside the lines of orthodox historic Orthodox Christian belief. And that's where this goes. It's where it goes. Uh, even my own, even Norman Geiser, uh, I sat in class myself and listened to him talk about how that if the, if the, the guy in, in whatever part of the country uh, who's never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ before uh, worships or responds positively to the light of, of natural revelation, general revelation, that God would send him a missionary. Now, now, Dr. Geiser never, as far as I know, when I studied under him and what I've read uh, of his works, and I have most of his books, uh, does not ever say that a person can be saved without hearing the gospel of Christ. Uh, but what he says is kind of a, 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 an intermediate step that that 
the unbeliever can respond positively to general revelation and God sends them a missionary. Now, that absolutely contradicts what Paul's writing here. Uh, it contradicts the doctrine of total depravity uh, because it affirms what the Bible denies to the unbeliever, that the unbeliever in themselves can respond positively to the light of general revelation. The scripture teaches just the opposite of that, right? The unbelieving mind, number two, the reason that the, the, uh, the reason that these assumptions are false regarding the, the unbeliever is that the unbelieving mind possesses knowledge of God's existence, but suppresses it. They know the, the unbelieving mind is not going to respond positively to the light of general revelation. The, in, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 tells us what the universal response is to a man regarding the general revelation that these that unbelievers have, that we all had prior to conversion, and that all unbelievers have right now who have not been converted. That response is the same. Unbelievers, unregenerate men, according to Romans 1, suppress the truth. They don't embrace it. They suppress it. What is known about God is evident within them. They know God is there. Natural revelation is universal. No one has the ability to hide from God's truth in general revelation to the point that they can justify their unbelief. This is a problem for the classical method. God made himself evident to them. This is, this is the clear language of Romans 1. God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So that, the Apostle Paul says, he says they're without excuse. They're without justification. The Greek word is anapologetus. They are without justification for their unbelief. That word anapologetus literally means not able to defend oneself or justify one's actions. The atheist is unjustified in his actions to refuse to believe or acknowledge his creator. This ad the adjective anapologetos without excuse is first used by Polybius to indicate the hopelessness of an argument. Apply this to exchanges with unbelievers who oppose Christ. Polybius used the same word Paul's using to say that their arguments are hopeless. Since God says that atheists have hopeless arguments, that they have absolutely no rational justification for their refusing to acknowledge their creator, then it is true that atheists have hopeless arguments. This again brings us back to the authority of Scripture. Now, since it is true that atheists have hopeless arguments, we cannot and we should not and we must not pretend Otherwise, and if we do, we would be guilty of violating the Christian ethic by pretending that God is wrong or that God is lying and that the atheist is telling the truth. The good news for you as a Christian, if you're evangelizing and sharing the gospel, and you really, you should be, you should be having gospel encounters. I'm not saying you have to go down to the corner and street and street preach. I'm not saying that you have to go anywhere and, and pass out tracts at events. But you should be, as you're going along your way, having encounters with people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It could be at an airport, on an airplane. It could be on a, on a subway. It could be on the train. It could be sitting in a restaurant at, at, uh, at waitresses. I'll oftentimes share the gospel with waitresses and ask them what they think about Christianity. Are they a Christian? Did you grow up in church? Have you since left the church? Especially uh, 
if the 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 waitress is college age, and I I'm in a, an area where I think this is probably a college student, and I bet you she she grew up in church, and now she's away at university, and all this nonsense is being thrown at at her or him, right? The problem with the unbelieving mind is not with logic or reason or evidence. It's ethical. His love for sin has a maddening and blinding effect. He is rejecting the only source of knowledge that he has, the very God that he is dependent on for knowing truth about reality. He is refusing to acknowledge and rely on. How could could that not end up having a maddening and blinding effect on the human intellect? It must. God gave the unregenerate mind sufficient evidence. This is why he has no excuse, no justification for what Paul describes as a hopeless argument in Romans 1. The conclusion then is that Christians should avoid this method of apologetics because to employ it is a violation of Christian ethics. We are pretending that God was either lying or wrong. God cannot lie or be wrong about anything he says. He's not capable of lying. He can't do it. Now, this brings us to some some philosophical criticisms. A lot of this is going to turn on, and you've probably never heard this expression, Google it, read it, study it, the principle of sufficient reason. And this, the principle of sufficient reason says that for every proposition P, if P is true, there is a proposition Q that explains P. Okay. Now, I'm going to work through this briefly. I do not want to get into the complex, the philosophical complexities that underlie uh, this principle. Uh, suffice it to say, the principle of sufficient reason is not without controversy. It is, it is not a, it is not universally accepted by philosophers that it exists. So I'm just saying this to, to I'm, I'm pointing this out to point out a more important truth. If you walk down this path, right, if you employ this method for uh, trying to prove that God exists, guess what else you're going to have to try to prove and defend? The principle of sufficient reason. Eventually, it's going to come up. You're going to have to defend why you think this principle holds, right? So I'm a presuppositionalist. I don't have to do I don't think that I have to prove God exists. I really don't. I I know that the atheist knows in his heart that God exists and that he's suppressing that truth. I also know that what converts that atheist isn't philosophical argumentation. It isn't evidence, it isn't logic, it isn't reason, it isn't a syllogism. It isn't any of that. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't complex. It's simple. I don't have to know anything about the principle of sufficient reason to be a good apologist, to be a good evangelist, to be a good Christian out here sharing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't need it. Now, I'm, I'm aware of these things because I'm involved in teaching uh, these things uh, like I'm teaching right now, which means that I avoid the complexities. I don't get buried underneath all of the philosophical complexities that attach to the classical method of apologetics. I teach Christians to avoid these things. If you, you, you need any kind of a knowledge of philosophy, it should be very basic. Just some of the, the language that's used in philosophy, things like epistemology, metaphysics, and uh, acquainted with logic. Now that, if you're going to study anything that was philosophical in nature, I would encourage you to study critical thinking, study logic, become acquainted with the basics of logical arguments and fallacies if you're going to study anything. You don't have to worry about Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, uh, any of these guys. All right. Hume 
points out that underlying the various versions of the cosmological argument is what we call the causal principle, or more broadly, the principle of sufficient reason. He argued that there is no reason to think that the causal principle is true a priori, for we can conceive of events occurring without conceiving of their being caused. And what is conceivable is possible in reality. Well, while the classical apologists apologists may have trouble with the idea that conceivability means possibility, I don't. I believe Hume's argument fails because it is not the case that just because something can be conceived in the human mind, that it is possible in reality. I don't accept that. Whose conceivability, first of all, are we talking about? What I can conceive or what you can conceive? Because what I can conceive is going to be different from what you might be able to conceive. So that's the first problem. Hume, whose conceivability are we talking about? Seems pretty subjective. Second, just because someone can conceive of a proposition being false, it does not follow that that proposition is possibly false. Just because I conceive of a, uh, of a proposition being false doesn't mean that it's remotely possible. It could, it could be impossible for that proposition to be false, but I could still conceive of it being false. So this is a, a criticism against Hume's view, but this objection is not really open to the, the classical apologists unless they want to dismiss Anselm's ontological argument altogether. This is the exact principle upon which Anselm's being greater than which no other being could be conceived argument turns. All right. J.L. Mackey, and there, there's a lot more to say about that, but that's not beyond the scope of what I'm trying to, beyond the scope of what I'm attempting to do here. All right. J.L. Mackey, I hope you didn't hear that. I just banged the microphone. J.L. Mackey, uh, uh, offers uh, up some criticism as well of the the, the principle of sufficient reason. Uh, Leibniz employed uh, this principle first, and basically we go back to this notion of contingent events. Contingent events require sufficient reason for their existence because they're contingent, right? Each thing in the world is contingent, being causally determined by other things, the world as a whole, being a collection of these contingent things, is itself contingent. The world, being a contingent series of things, requires a sufficient reason outside itself. Therefore, a necessary being upon which all contingent things depend must exist. This necessary being we call God. Can you see the pattern of these arguments? The pattern is the same. Okay, so here's the question. Does this argument from the principle of sufficient reason prove the existence of Yahweh? Where in the argument does this prove that Yahweh exists? Does the argument demonstrate the truth of the claim that the ontological triune God of Scripture exists? No. Not only that... This argument does not prove that some God exists at all. I've given you three versions of arguments from, let's just call it the idea of causation. Alvin Plantinger writes, Our verdict on these reformed, form, reformulated, reformulated versions of St. Anselm's argument must be as follows. They cannot, perhaps, be said to prove or establish their conclusion. But since it is rational to accept their central premise, they do show that it is rational to accept their conclusion. And perhaps that is all that can be expected of any such argument. So at best, Alvin Plantinga says that it's only rational that we could accept the conclusion. It doesn't mean that the arguments are true. It only means that they have a valid form, right? Are we here to talk about whether, are we here to talk about that belief that God exists is reasonable? Or are we supposed to be proving that God exists? Which, which is it? The classical approach is, and if you remember Aquinas's five ways, 
are proving God exists. The classical method sets out to prove that God exists. Now, what ends up happening with the classical method is that it does end up saying that God probably exists. And this is a real this is a real problem. Richard Taylor in his book titled Metaphysics, and by the way, the quote I gave you from Alvin Planning is from his book, uh, The Nature of Necessity. Richard Taylor in his book titled Metaphysics, uh, the principle of sufficient re- he says the principle of sufficient reason can be illustrated in various ways, but it cannot be proved. If one were to try proving it, he would sooner or later have to appeal to considerations that are less plausible than the principle itself. Indeed, it is hard to see how one could even make an argument for it without already assuming it. For this reason, it might properly be called a presupposition of reason itself. And if that's where you're going to go with the principle of sufficient reason, which is probably where you should go, then you are already stepping over into a different method of apologetics called presuppositional apologetics, and you are moving away from this classical method. In this argument against the principle of sufficient reason, we see what every apologist who takes the presuppositional approach to answering the unbeliever already knows. The only coherent approach to answering the questions and objections of unbelievers regarding Christian theism is to take a presuppositional approach. God is the necessary precondition of intelligibility, in fact, of all human predication. That's the presuppositional method of apologetics, right? Turek and Scribner, all right, fail in proving the the existence of God. And it's probably because when you think about who God is, and you think about the world, and you think about Christianity and what Christianity teaches, that we don't have to prove that some God exists. You, you have to remember this. The objective of schools like Southern Evangelical Seminary and, and modern classical apologetics, its methods, seems to be philosophical respectability rather than faithfulness to divine revelation. I know that's a harsh, that's a harsh criticism, uh, but if you read William Lane Craig, uh, even in his book with J.P. Moreland on worldviews, this is where they start. We have to restore intellectual respectability to Christianity. And uh, the way you do that is you remove all these obstacles. Well, you know, you start removing these obstacles. Where do you stop? Uh, Okay, let's have an old earth. That's already been done, right? They removed the young earth earth doctrine because it's an obstacle in the university because all the scientists believe in their philosophy that the earth is old, right? Right? Uh, scientism. Science is their authority. And if you say the earth is young, somewhere between six and 10,000 years old, you are a laughingstock. It is an obstacle, and you no longer have intellectual cognitive respectability. You are mocked. All right. Just like the seeker-sensitive movement, the emergent church, and now the social justice movement, the objective is to remove obstacles to the Christian worldview. Remember, Christian, remember this, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, okay? And keep this in mind. The apostle Paul said the same in the same chapter, the world through its wisdom does not come to know God. The unbeliever does not come to God through his own capacity to understand Christianity, Right? And then act prudently in making a decision to follow Christ, as so many of these apologists want you to believe. There are thousands of false converts in the churches right now because of methods like this. Paul could not have been clearer 
even though some reform men over the course of church history have employed the classical method, Arminianism is the logical default theological position of the classical method. And since Arminianism is false and out of step with Scripture, and especially modern Arminianism, then the method of apologetics employed by that system or that is entailed by that system is also false. I should also point out that there are many philosophers who claim that there really is no such thing as what we would call metaphysical necessity. This is why I hold to the view uh, that there's logical necessity, there are the laws of physics, there is contingency, and that God is a logically necessary being. I don't get caught up in these issues that are hotly contested because if you do, you're going to have to defend them as well. And this is going to require you to engross yourself in philosophy. And here's my here's my take. Uh, I heard Scribner say, make a comment uh, regarding these issues that the reason Christians are ignorant of these issues is because they do not... Um, is because they're lazy. Uh, and I, I agree that, that Christians are lazy. And uh, uh, But my, my comment to you is don't study philosophy. I want you first to be uh, absorbed in Scripture. Get your nose in Scripture. Buy Cl- Cliff McManus's book, Biblical Apologetics, first, and get yourself immersed in Scripture. And if you want to study apologetics, start with that book. And then proceed from there. It's a great foundation for doing apologetics the way Scripture teaches us to do apologetics. Now, I'll give you my argument for God from logic. And again, I'm not not seeking to prove that God exists. What I'm seeking to prove is that the the unbeliever who refuses to acknowledge God has absolutely no basis whatsoever to defend rationality at all. Now, if God is the necessary condition for all human predication, even the not the denial of God's existence must presuppose God's existence. Okay? Now, follow me here. If the laws of logic are necessary truths, properties of, of the mind, that is to say, true in all possible worlds, and if the laws of logic are properties of the mind, then it follows that there must be a mind that is true or that exists in all possible worlds. If the laws of logic are necessary truths, which means they exist in all possible worlds, and they are properties of the mind, that is to say they are, they are dependent on the existence of mind, right? That means that the mind that they are dependent on has to exist in all possible worlds. This means that one cannot have laws of logic without also having a logically necessary mind, In other words, if God is not logically necessary, then neither are the laws of logic. If the laws of logic are indeed like the laws of physics, simply human constructs that describe how the world works, then they're contingent. And if they are contingent, the very idea or ideas of necessity and contingency are rendered meaningless. And if necessity and contingency are meaningless, why are we arguing about anything at all? The law of non-contradiction is not a law after all. We can toss it. Now what? You just landed in irrationalism. You just landed in not being able to know anything at all when you dispense with the laws of logic. All knowledge goes with them. It's out the door. In short, the argument for some God from efficient causality is philosophically embarrassing, not not because it is necessarily irrational. It is embarrassing because it does not come remotely close to proving that some God exists. It only succeeds in showing that it is possible to prove that the belief that some God exists is a reasonable belief. And since Christians are charged with providing a defense for the distinctively Christian beliefs, the argument is an embarrassing one, both philosophically and theologically. Christians do not believe it's possible that some God exists. That's not what we believe. Christians do not just believe that it is reasonable to believe that some God exists. Christians know that Yahweh exists because we know him, just like we know one another. 
we know that the ontological triune God of Scripture is the creator of all things, both created or contingent. Christians know that every man will give an account to God in the end and that only faith in Jesus Christ can rescue the sinner from the divine summons that will inevitably call each and every sinner before the judge to give an account for their sin, for how they live their lives. This is the truth that every Christian has to articulate. We must articulate and defend this truth with every evangelical encounter that we have. As Greg Bonson used to say, the proof of the Christian God is that without him, it is impossible to prove anything. Amen. Well, thank you for listening. If you have any questions and you're listening to the Reformed Rant in the Anchor app, you can leave questions, comments there. If not, you can go over to Reformation Charlotte. Uh, you can also uh, go to the uh, the Facebook page, Reformation Charlotte. You can go to um, the Facebook page for the Reformed Rant. Um, and then there is Reformed Reasons, which is my uh, website, where you can leave questions or comments. Keep the faith. Continue to spread the gospel. Continue to defend the faith. Continue to exalt and serve your Creator with all of your being. Amen. God bless. Merry Christmas. <music>